If, if there's a situation in your life, you can sit down if, if, uh, if, if you're, this is not you, but if there's a situation in your life where you feel like you've been defeated, that there's not an answer, where it's impossible, the odds, that sort of thing, just remain saying, I just want to pray for you. I just have a sense we need to pray into that today. So God, we, we just come before you. And God, uh, those that are just standing, God, you know the situations. You know the things they are facing today in their lives. And so God, we just want to, to lay those situations at your feet. God, that power, that um, resurrection power that was alive 2,000 years ago is alive today. And Lord, we just ask that you would release that power, that you would release um, your, your grace, that you would release your spirit, release your love into every situation that's represented right now by those that are standing. That God, that the answers they've been seeking, they would start to, to find that the, the way forward, God, would start to become clear. That, God, the obstacles that have been in the way, Father, would just start to be moved. And, Lord, we just want to thank you, God. I just want to praise you. And I want to thank you for the testimony and for the things that you're going to do in the lives of those that are standing right now. The answers to their prayers. And so, Lord, we just ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. Well, for, uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Eric, and I'm the Life Center pastor here. You probably see me most of the time up here holding a bass, so I'm not just a bass player. Um, I am one of the pastors here, and, uh, and it's an absolute privilege to be able to speak with you this morning. Um, we're starting a, a bit of a new series. You might call it a series, but it's not one that we're following a, a certain book of the Bible or a theme or anything, but it's going to go along the lines of, uh, it's called One from the Heart. And so it's going to be an opportunity for, for some of us uh, on staff to come and sort of share what God has been laying on our heart for our church and, uh, and what's, what is God saying in this season. And so I have the, the privilege of, of sort of starting this series today and being the first one to, to kick that off. And, and the way uh, I'd like to kick it off is, is where God has really touched my heart and where God is really leading me. Uh, I've titled this today, Too Busy Not to Pray. Now, uh, that sounds kind of funny. It sounds kind of like that doesn't quite make sense. Are you sure you got that right? That I'm too busy not to pray. But I think uh, as you see uh, what I'm going to share today and, and hear what I'm going to share today, you're going to start to see that prayer becomes such a key part of the Christian life. That if, if we get too busy with other things and we neglect that part, that conversation, that engagement with God, uh, it leaves us actually uh, limited in a lot of ways. You know, we live in a world that just never stops. I find myself, people go, hey, how are you going? What, 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 you know, what's going on? How was your week? And I find myself always saying, oh, it's good. I'm doing good, but I'm really busy. And I've been trying to actually stop myself from saying that lately. But it's an honest answer. I'm just so busy. And if you're like me, and, and I talk to many of you, I know that you are, that our lives are so full. There's the demands of work, the stress of school, we have to buy groceries, there's cars to fix, there's problems to solve, there's social media profiles to update. You know, there's all these things that we are doing, and we're, we just never stop. And it feels like we never catch up, much less get to do the things that we love the things we're passionate about, because we're just in this cycle of busyness. And you know, I, I also hear, and, and sometimes feel this way as well, we've just done a, a big sermon series called Love Declared, Love Demonstrated. And in the midst of that busyness, we hear something where we're encouraged and, and we're, we're told it's, you know, God's calling us to go out, to share the gospel, to be light in the world. But in our busyness, we hear that as just another burden. It's just another thing on our to-do list. So on top of everything, I'm supposed to advance Christ's kingdom too, great. Just another, another thing on our to-do list. And, and sometimes it feels that way. So th this is what I wanna talk about this morning because we don't always give a lot of emphasis for this, but there's a flip side to the going out. And it's the before you go out, you pray. You see, there's something I think that's wrong in our culture currently, in the busyness that we, we have. There's something that needs to change. 
Because we are, as a church and as individuals, if we know God, we are called to extend the kingdom, to go out, to be a blessing in our world. But we're so busy. How do we add in that on top of our huge to-do list? But see, I say the answer to that is we must pray. And I'm not talking about just simple, I've got to pray, so I'm going to say a 30-second prayer. But we've got to pray. We've got to talk to God. We've got to listen to God. We are too busy not to pray. You know, I I believe that God has given us such a fantastic vision and, and message and purpose, mission for for going into our city and and ultimately into our world. But we're not going to accomplish that if we don't, if we neglect prayer. And you know what, God has awesome things for your life too, as individuals. And you won't see the fullness of that if prayer is not a priority of yours. John Wesley, um, you know, he's, he's an amazing man. He, uh, he started the, the Methodist church and, and was just such a figure um, for, for many years and still to this day, still impacts the church worldwide with his, um, with his ministry and all that, that he, he did. There's a quote by him which I love, and I heard it many years ago, and it's taken me a long time. Thankfully, God brought me to it because I've been trying to find it. You know, it was one of those things, I heard someone give this quote and I'm going, I don't know where it's from, I can't find it. And I have, I've literally looked for it for, for years and never found it and this week God let me find it. It says, I have so much to do that I spend several hours in prayer before I'm able to do it. How different is that to, to our attitudes? I don't know if you're like me, but you know, I come many times, my mornings are very, very busy. I have three small kids, getting them to school and, and fed and make sure they're wearing shoes and you know, all that kind of stuff in the mornings. I, I don't spend a lot of time early in the morning praying, but I always come to work and I have this intention that when I get here, I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna read my Bible, I'm gonna spend some time praying. We have a soaking time, I'm gonna go get to that. You know, and I'm gonna go be a part of that. And then I turn the computer on and I find there's 54 emails and you know, 53 of them, there's a problem or there's something that needs to be handled or uh, what, what have you. And then I find, oh, it's lunchtime and I still haven't prayed, still haven't cracked open the word. And I'm just finding, I don't know if you're the same, but I just find if I would stop and take those five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever, you know, soaking times 30 minutes, We're all busy, we have a lot on our plate. But if I stop and do those things, my day actually goes much better. I'm actually able to be more effective at what I do. And that's not just because I work in a church. This is true of you too, regardless of what you do. If you start with that prayer, it makes you more efficient. And this is what I think John Wesley was was saying. I have so much to do today that I have to spend time with God if I want to accomplish it. Anyway, I love that quote. It challenged me and and has challenged me for years. See, unfortunately, I believe that prayer is one of the most neglected elements of our Christian life. We all agree that prayer is very important, but very few of us prioritize prayer. And that's, that's the trick there. I took a little survey. Now, given it, these are all, you know, church staff people but I got about 20 responses and I had a couple of little survey questions and I, you know, one of the first questions was on a scale of one to 10, how important do you see prayer being in a Christian life? And you you guys are getting your money's worth because every single one of them put 10. They all said 10, it's very, very important. And I would say, even if we did a show of hands today and I said, how many of you guys think prayer is important? Just about everybody would raise their hand. But then, if I ask, how often do you actually pray then? There would be many of us that would have to think about it and go, well, I do say, you know, the blessing before I eat dinner each night. I did, I did you know, quickly go, God, please help me in the staff meeting today before I go in, you know. And we find these little short bursts of prayer. But there's this disconnect between 
what we say we believe, that prayer is this important element of the Christian life, and then our practice. You know, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, it says, it tells us to pray continually. If you're old school, I grew up hearing it, pray without ceasing. (laughs) But to pray continually, what does that mean? I don't think it means that we, we sit in a, in a dark room and just pray all day and neglect the rest of our life. But it is saying there must be this culture, this attitude that prayer is a part of my life, just like breathing, just like eating, just like working. It's part of my life. And it, it's included in every aspect. Here's some other quotes by John Wesley. I love this. It says, God does nothing but by prayer and everything with it. You know, before I became Life Center pastor, um, part of my, my role here, you could probably call me the prayer pastor because really my role involves prayer in lots of various different ways. And before I came into this role, um, honestly, I don't think I had ever spent more than, than a few moments, maybe, maybe up to an hour in prayer ever before in my life. And I've been a Christian since I was five years old. And I think that's pretty common of an experience for someone. But all of a sudden, here I am, I'm now in charge of prayer. And supposed to be, you know, John and I talk about this, we really want to see uh, a culture of prayer over River Life. That we would be a church that prays before anything else. That prayer is our focus. And so I had to start to kind of develop this. And so one of the things that I was a part of, first of all, was intercessors. And that's kind of a big scary word. I'd never done like proper intercession before. I didn't really know what it was about. And all of a sudden here I am, I'm thrown in and we're, we're praying sometimes for three hours at a time. <laughs> um, Sometimes we would do the Encountering God weekends as part of the streams ministry, and we would literally pray the entire weekend. And it fascinated me that all of a sudden I've gone from not praying a whole lot and not for an extended amount of time to praying for like 72 hours. You know, only taking a little break to sleep. And through that, God, God has taught me so much. And this is where this next quote from John Wesley comes in. He says, prayer is where the action is. And this is what I learned. I thought, okay, praying, God, you're, you're, you know, give him some adoration, give him some praise, spend some time asking him for things, whatever else, I'm, I'm out, I'm out. What, do I, what else do I say? Look, I'm an introvert. I don't talk a whole lot. So to, to, you know, and prayer is kind of like a conversation with God. So I'm just going, I'm going to run out of things to say pretty quick. But it's amazing when you start to align your heart with him and you start to pray in there. Prayer is where the action is. You want to do something exciting in our church? Come be an intercessor. I'm not kidding. You want to you live on the wild side? Do you want to see the edges of, of what is possible, what God is saying, what God is doing, what is just exciting? Come and be an intercessor. Yes, we might be behind the scenes somewhere in a room that you don't see, you don't hear, but God is moving in those places. This is where you see God's hand move. It sounds like a passive thing. But if you want to be a part of what the action is, go be an intercessor. Go be in, in God's presence and praying. Hudson Taylor, who's a Chinese missionary, very famous Chinese missionary, he says, I have seen many men work without praying, though I have never seen any good come of it, but I have never seen a man pray without working. We just recently had Brian Heasley from 24 seven prayer come and speak as part of our Kingdom Come conference. And you know, he says that prayer and mission go hand in hand. Each one leads back to the other. They're inseparable. So we've been talking so much, let's go and declare love, demonstrate love. 
But before we do that, we need to pray. You know, Brian and his wife, they, they spent uh, many years in Ibiza, and, but he said for the first, um, I think it was seven months or seven years, I think it was seven months, they, all they did was pray. They would walk the city and pray. And then God started to do stuff. And that's when the mission started. So they go back and forth. When we stop and we pray, it aligns our hearts with God's. So that when we go out, just as Jesus was doing, right? He said, I'm only doing what I hear the Father saying and, and do what the Father is, is doing. How did he know what God was saying and what God was doing? He prayed. He spent time with God before he would go and preach on the mount, before he would ride in the boat, before he would go to the pool at Bethesda, before he would go, he'd already spent time with God. He knew what God wanted to do that day. And then he went and did it. Because prayer and mission go hand in hand. And you know, we, we have this, this great mission to demonstrate and declare God's love, but our mission is only gonna be as effective as it is supported in prayer. Before we go out, we must pray, and not some short obligatory prayer. We do that a lot, right? It's not that we don't pray. I just think we don't pray with effect, and we don't pray with power, because we don't take the time to wait on God. So God, please just help us now. We're about to go out and uh, demonstrate and, and declare your, your love in this scheme. Would you just be with us and, and help us? Amen. All right, let's go, guys. We do this, don't we? Now, this is not a condemnation. This is just what we do because we're busy. We're, we're ready to go. We're people of action. But yet God says, be still and know that I'm God. Wait on me. And in that waiting, I'm going to reveal my heart. I'm going to reveal my purposes. When we wait on God, and then we pray in accordance to his direction. That's the kind of prayer that changes the world. You know, I, I've been doing a, a Master's of Divinity and I'm in my second year, but a lot of uh, the last six months I've been doing several courses in church history. And um, one of the things that has really stood out to me as I've been studying the church and its history and all the, the different characters and movements and struggles and obstacles and all that the church has faced is that nearly every revival, never, nearly every major move of God, every major person that we are still reading about in history, prayer is a center point of all those movements and all those people. That is the one key thing and the one consistent thing that when we see God move in significant ways, prayer is involved. One of... Uh, one of the people who really caught my attention was a man named Charles Finney. You may have heard of Charles Finney. He um, is, they, they say he's the founder of the Second Great Awakening, particularly in America, and he had some influence as well as in the UK. Um, he, was, he was a preacher, an evangelist. Uh, he started in about 1821, and he died about 1875. So in that 50 or so years of time, everywhere he went, revival happened. But the thing about Finney, um, history tells us that over the course of that time, over a million people became converts. And they were saying in other revivals, and we even have heard this with like Billy Graham, that there would be up to 75, 80% that would backslide and then would go away. They're saying up to 80% stayed faithful, stayed strong in the revivals that Charles Finney led. It wasn't his preaching, I think, that ushered in the revivals, but what he did was he would spend many hours in prayer, preceding every town or every city that he would go and preach in. And Finney called this prevailing prayer. That's what he called what he did before he would go and preach, is prevailing prayer. And this is a prayer that expressed and carried a burden for the lost. It was a determined and faith-filled prayer. So he would pray and pray and pray and wait on God and pray and wait on God. And God would place this burden on his shoulders, not, not a heavy burden, but a burden for the lost, for the people of that city. 
And he would pray into it. And then he would go into that town and he would start to speak. And people would just be overcome in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit's conviction would be so heavy that they they would just be filled with tears. They would fall down before God. They would give their lives to him. It was a powerful thing. And the thing was, his revivals were all built upon this prayer, and then they left a legacy of prayer behind them. This is uh, an excerpt. He was very um, active in the the northeastern part of the United States. So he spent, sometimes he would spend three months or six months in one city and just minister there for a time, and then he'd go somewhere else. But this is an excerpt about uh, the time he was in, in New York State. It says, Finney urged the people to pray to God earnestly and expectantly for the immediate outpouring of his Holy Spirit. He told them that if they united in prayer, they would get God's answer quicker than a letter could come from Albany, the state's capital. So several men agreed to prove God in that way, and their prayer was answered just that quickly. And this is from Finney's own writings. He says, Finney wrote, indeed, the town was full of prayer. Go where you would, you heard the voice of prayer. Pass along the streets, and if two or three Christians happened to be together, they were praying. Wherever they met, they prayed. Wherever there was a sinner, unconverted, especially if he manifested any opposition, you would find some two or three brothers or sisters agreeing to make him a particular subject of prayer. And it was, was, was very remarkable to see what an extent God would answer prayer immediately. A whole city, and this, was, this wasn't just isolated to one place. Everywhere he went for those 50 years, this is what happened. People would start praying. Stories like, the stories go on and on and on. This is why Finney stood out to me. Children at school would meet early to pray. They were praying in homes. They were praying everywhere. It was just, it was just this, God just did amazing things. But do you notice, there's a few things. Finney asked them, he he said, I want you to earnestly pray. To be earnest in your prayers. To be expectant. To pray with expectancy. Not expecting God to do one thing. Not with an expectation that it looks like this. But with an expectancy that God is going to move. God is going to do great things. And the one that, that I have learned is to do it in a unified way. See, we have to pray together as a church. It's not just my job because prayer is under my portfolio. It's not just the pastor's job. It's not just the intercessor's job. We as a church must be unified to pray. If you want to declare and demonstrate Christ's kingdom, his love in this world and see Brisbane change, see Australia change, to see the world touched, we have to unify together to pray. It has to become a culture. See, prayer is the key that engages God's power in our lives and in our world. You know, I have mentioned, we've been so blessed. I mean, we sit here in this beautiful building. Sometimes I still find it, even though we've been here almost a year, I still find it a surreal experience to to walk in these doors every day and go, this is my church. My goodness, God, you are so good. You are so awesome. We've been blessed in such amazing resources. I'm always blown away by how committed and capable the people are of this church. If you need something done, you ask someone and they get it done and they get it done so well. You guys are amazing. God has blessed this church community with such amazing resources, both in people, finances, our building. We are blessed. But God hasn't just blessed us so that we can sit here and enjoy the air conditioning on a Sunday, hear some songs, hear somebody talk, and go home. God's calling us to be a light in this city. We've talked about it before, but there's been prophetic words spoken over our church. Nearly every person who who speaks internationally comes in here and goes, this is different. I speak all over the world. This place is different in a good way. Why are they, what are they picking up? What are they sensing? And why are we not seeing the fruit of that in its fullness? We are seeing fruit, okay? I'm just challenging you today. I'm pushing you today. 
I mean, last month we had close to 100 people give their lives to the Lord through different various ministries and, and, and services. How incredible is that? God is moving. Yeah. God is moving. But you know, even Brian Heasley, he commented on, we, we do a podcast, and if you haven't heard it, I encourage you to go listen to, to Brian's podcast uh, at this part of our, our church's podcast. And he was saying, you know, if you have a church that has 10,000 people, we don't have that yet, but in a city of 5 million, it's a drop in the bucket. What, what impact? I mean, it, it, it's just a few people in the great many. So this is what I'm saying. Praise God that he's moving, but I want to see it greater. I want to see our city, actually, I want to see the culture change as Finney saw those things change, where when you walk down the street, people are praying. How incredible would that be? And I've, I believe God has given us everything that we need to see that happen. You know, the, the prophetic words are that we're going to be a church of influence, that we're going to be a place where the broken come to be healed, a place where the lost are found, a place where the lonely find belonging. You know, one of our, our goals is to be to demonstrate un unprecedented levels of compassion. That can't come from us. It can only come from God. How do we tap into that? We pray. We pray. I just want to very quickly touch on what are some of the things that keep us from, from praying? Because we, as I said, we all go, yep, prayer's important. I hear you. Okay, you've beat that dead horse. It's good. All right. But we all agree, but why don't we do it? So I think there's, there's uh, many reasons, but these are five that I think are, are the most common. One is time. We just do not schedule time to pray. We schedule time to go to the gym. We schedule time to watch, you know, binge watch our favorite TV show. We schedule time to do the things that we want to do and that are important to us, but we don't schedule time to pray. And many times, as I was sharing, we address the urgent instead of the important. There's a difference between intentionally praying and a reactional prayer. Now, God wants us to do both. There are those times where we go, oh, I'm in a situation, didn't see that coming. God, help. He wants to hear those prayers. But there's a difference when we intentionally go to God to say, God, what's on the agenda today? What are you asking me to do? What do you want to do in this world today? I have this sphere of influence, God. What do you want to do in that sphere? And waiting on him. There's a difference. You know, Psalm 46.10, it says, Be still and know that I am God. And if we look at Jesus, who's supposed to be our perfect example, from Mark 1.35, it says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary play, place where he prayed. That's how he knew what the Father was saying and doing, and he could replicate it. It's because he went away and spent time with him. Second area is unbelief. We don't believe that prayer actually changes anything. We may, we may not believe that God hears us or cares about our situation. Or that maybe praying really can infiltrate our dark world and change it. We might just see it as this activity that we're supposed to do. That's unbelief. But nothing could be further from the truth. God cares about what we care about. God cares about our world. Luke 12, verses 6 through 7, it says, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. He cares about you, and he cares about our world. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And James 5, 16b says, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. I think another thing that hinders us many times is bitterness. Sometimes God does not answer our prayers in the way we think he should. We blame him unfairly or we judge him. So we've prayed about something and the outcome was not what we expected or was not what we thought was right. And we blame God and we become bitter. We see him as being unloving or ineffective or even un, un, uninvolved in our lives. Let me just say to you, 
Bitterness is one of the fastest ways to put a wall up between you and God. If you feel like he's distant and you feel like you, you know, your prayers hit the ceiling, I'm talking to you kind of from my prayer ministry background on this. Stop and ask God, is there bitterness in my heart? Have I judged you, God? Let him show you that because you want to get rid of that because it will stop your prayers in a lot of ways. See, God is not some cosmic genie who we, we throw our request up to and he answers. He doesn't always act in the ways that we expect. And sometimes, just like, you know, I'm a father, sometimes my kids ask me for something and I say no. It's not because whatever it is was bad or I am being mean. It's just I see the bigger picture. They have a limited perspective. I have the bigger perspective as the father. If you do this, then it's going to mean this and this and this, and that's why I'm saying no. And they see me as the cosmic killjoy, but it's because we're the same way, guys. We have a perspective like this, and God's perspective is infinite. So sometimes we ask him for things and it doesn't come the way we think it should, and we get angry. Don't let that happen. God is good. God is faithful. That's a whole nother sermon I can preach. Don't let bitterness put a wall between you and God. Isaiah 55, eight through nine says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, this is God speaking, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Next obstacle is pride. Many times we believe that we don't need to pray, that we can figure it out on our own. Regardless of what we're trying to achieve, when we include God in it, the effect and the fruit of it's gonna be so much greater. And as I said, you guys are very talented, very capable, intelligent, awesome people. I would never doubt any of you for a second. But when you add God into the equation, if you put him first, whatever you are trying to achieve, will be much more effective. You know, Proverbs 16, 9, it says, in, in their hearts, humans plan their course, but it's the Lord that establishes their steps. Finally, self-focused prayers. I think we get hung up on this, and I think this is an obstacle to actually seeing God move in greater ways, is self-focused prayers. Now, this does not mean that we shouldn't ask God for our, our needs and to talk to him personally. He wants that. But when, if all you ever pray is going, God, can you do this in my life or in my, immediately, my immediate family's life, if your whole focus never goes past yourself and your needs, you're limiting your prayers. You're having, if we talk about prayer as a conversation, you're having a one-sided conversation. And you're having a one-sided relationship, for that matter, because you're always receiving and you're never giving. We need to be quiet before God sometimes too. We need to give him a chance to speak to us as well. And when we do this, our heart starts to align with his heart. And we know that his heart beats for a lost world. I won't quote it, but you guys know John 3.16, right? So I want to encourage you, okay? If there's nothing else that, that you hear from me today, hear this. I want you to take from this, this message today a challenge to prioritize prayer. That in your life, you will prioritize prayer. Now that'll look different for each of you. I'm not saying you need to go and spend two hours praying every day. That might be what you do, but I'm not challenging you for that. But what I'm asking you to do is to start to pray more than you do right now. To start small and build it up. It might be that you don't pray at all and just to stop before you eat and thank God for that meal, that might be the challenge for you. Some other ways that you can maybe start to implement this is to try soaking prayer. We do this as a staff and we've been doing it for a little while. And look, it's very simple. You put on some worship music, you can sit up, you can lie down, you can do whatever, but basically you sit and soak in God's presence. You invite God to be there with you and you listen and you rest 
in him. That's why we call it soaking. Now, sometimes you fall asleep and you snore, and we call it snorkeling. (laughs) That's okay, too. But that's maybe something you can try if prayer is hard. If you go, I don't really know what to say to God, then don't say anything. Just sit in his presence. Say, God, come and make me aware of your presence. I'm sitting before you now. Speak, move, work in me over this next 10 minutes, next half hour. You might want to try journaling. This is the way that I personally pray. So when when I'm praying, I actually have a journal and I write out my whole prayer. I mean, it's literally, dear Jesus, thanks for this day. And then I go, like I write out my entire prayers, I journal. But as part of that, I also ask God questions. God, what do I do about this? And then I shut up and wait. And I let him speak, and then I try and write what I feel like God is saying to me. And many times, it's a different voice. It's not my voice that comes with those replies, if you know what I mean. And what's great about journaling is you can put your prayer request in and then go back and start to go, oh, that's right. I asked God to work in that area of my life, and this is what happened. Now I see it. That took six months, but now I see God working. And and so journaling is a fantastic way to do that. Um, I had a quick look on, on uh, I'm an Android user, I'm not an iPhone guy, but I had a quick look on, on Google Play and uh, the Play Store, whatever it's called. There's heaps of apps for prayer. So if you're more tech-minded, go and look and find an app and put it on your phone and use it every day. Some of them are scripture-based, some of them are reminders, some of them are devotional, but go find an app that'll help you to pray. But again, the key, if you hear nothing else I say today, prioritize prayer. Start to include it in your life every day in some way. You know, it's a simple, I drive the kids to school every day. Every day we pray before we go into school. Who wants to pray today? Different ones of my kids will pray. If they don't want to pray, then I pray. And it's simple. But we pray every day. So my dream, and I think the dream of this church is that we become a church, a culture of prayer. Because that is what God is calling us to. If we're to reach this dark world, it's gonna require this engine room of prayer behind it. Would Would you pray with me as I finish? God, I thank you so very much that it's not about what we do or what we don't do, but God, it's about your faithfulness. And Lord, I just pray today that those that hear me, Father, would not hear it as as a judgment or a condemnation or even as I said, the word challenge. God, I, I pray that this would not be a burden, but God, I just pray that this would be an encouragement to everyone here to change and to shift our focus and our thoughts and our opinions about prayer and align them with what it truly is, God. And as we pray, God, I I just, I wanna thank you now. This is another practice, God, you've just shown me, is I wanna thank you in advance. Before we hold it in our hands, before the testimonies are shared, God, I wanna thank you for what you're, you're going to do because you are faithful and good. God, would you help us to be faithful to steward all that you've given us and to be people of prayer, to be people who cry out to you, who hear your voice, who wait on your hand, and then God, become those hands and feet in our world, to be the voices of love and encouragement and healing and hope. God, would you work through us? God, I just pray there would be a unity among us, God. May our hearts be as one in love for one another and as one in you. Lord, we just bless you in Jesus' name.